children you know. Computer woman wants to be treated like a lady. But her voice is so cold, rude, and shady. She will cut you off in the middle of grieving, in the middle of loving, in the middle of leaving. That's cold. That's cold. Let me monitor and record it. GPL, your computer daddy. Can go straight to hell. I'm feeling, I'm caring. No human in your voice. 60 seconds is your choice. Computer woman wants to be treated like a lady, but her voice is so cold, rude, and shady. This call, this call will be monitored and recorded. Trails you are set on fire, your sweet toes breaking new ground. Gypsy woman rippling waters, dancing leaves no one can hold. There's fire in your eyes, fire in your soul. I wonder how you are flowing. Deep music, sweet sounds, pounds, revives my soul to life. 
there's kindness, wisdom in your verse and blessings in your touch. Visionaries, simple and dynamic, deep and organic, real to the bone. Your found spirit, ageless and boundless and round. Gypsy woman, no one can tame. Fantasy free to roam land, air, and sea. If the moon flows and the wind blows with candy apple toes on warm sands, haunts me and takes me to dreamland. But just love me for a moment, no strings or unholy things. Hold me like a bear and fall, no strings or unholy things. Me and your love, juicy like a peach. Hold me like a bear and eat, and I'll be all the better for it. My heart is big and bold enough to absorb all the love. To break my heart is to heal my heart. To break my heart is to heal my heart. So break my heart over and over and engulf me in your dreams, juicy like a peach. Gypsy woman, rippling waters, dancing leaves, no one can hold. There's magic in your waves, you unfold. how we can ultimately dismantle any of it if we don't stick to a to a you know intensely radical politics you're not broke if you're taxing rich people
We break production for profit and we replace it by production for need. This event is brought to you by Haymarket Books. Now more than ever, it is critical to support independent publishers, independent bookstores, and independent voices. There are two ways you can do this today. First, by buying books from Haymarket at haymarketbooks.org. And secondly, by joining the Haymarket Book Club. The following event will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel, like this video now, and share it with as many people as possible. If you like this event, be sure to catch these upcoming events in Haymarket's live stream series. You can register for these upcoming events on the Haymarket Books Eventbrite page. If you miss an event, you can listen to the recording afterward by subscribing to our podcast, Haymarket Live, wherever you get your podcasts. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are moderating the chat, but we cannot guarantee that everyone will observe our community guidelines. People who violate these guidelines will have their comments deleted as quickly as we are able. This event will have live closed captions. Instructions for accessing the captions will be posted in the chat. We should have time for Q&A. So please post your questions in the YouTube chat window, and we'll get to those later in the program. Thanks for joining us today. Our event will begin shortly. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us um, about Books Through Bars, Stories from the Prison Books Movement, uh, a book which documents the long-standing grassroots efforts that have been quietly pushing back against mass incarceration for over 70 years. Um, our thoughts tonight are not far from the open-air prison, which is Gaza, a place whose population parallels the number of people incarcerated um, in the U.S. I co-edited this collection and I'll be asking three authors from this volume, Andy, Julie, and James, questions for the next hour. Um, and then we'll have some time for some audience questions at the end. Um, first, I'm gonna introduce everyone. Um, I am Moira Marquis. Um, I have a PhD in literature. I used to teach college and, and volunteered with many prison books programs throughout the years and now I work at Pen America and the Prison and Justice Writing Program. Um, Dr. Andy Chan has volunteered and been an organizer at Books to Prisoners Seattle since 1994. Um, Andy established the first nationwide communication forum for prison book programs and helped challenge the attempt to ban books, ban used books in uh, Washington facilities. He also co-authored a Washington Post op-ed on prison censorship and has talked on NPR and NBC about prison book issues. Um, Julie Schneier is a prison abolitionist working with Asheville Prison Books since 2011. Julie participates in numerous groups challenging state repression and supporting incarcerated folks, including the Asheville Community Bail Fund and Blue Ridge ABC. She holds a master's degree in literacy, culture, and language education from Indiana University and teaches adult basic ed at AB Tech Community College. 
Uh, James King is the co-director of programs for the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Prior to joining the organization, James worked to build recognition of the value of people who are being held in carceral spaces. James is also a writer and organizer, having written numerous op-eds and a weekly blog that gave first-person perspective of the true impact of mass criminalization and living within the prison industrial complex. He also co-wrote and presented a TEDx talk called From Proximity to Power that advocates for recognizing the value and expertise of people who come from marginalized communities. As an organizer, he founded a think tank of incarcerated people who are passionate about criminal justice policy and built relationships throughout uh, the criminal legal reform movement. So we're going to start with Andy tonight. Um, you've been organizing with Books to Prisoners Seattle for a long time. Um, can you tell us what drew you to this work and um, what keeps you invested in it? Yeah, thank you, Moira, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, OK, so I first came to Books to Prisoners, uh, as Moira mentioned, in uh, 1994, a really long time ago. Um, and that was because I I'd moved to Seattle, where the organization is based, and uh, I was looking for something meaningful to do. Um, and, uh, you know, we're right, this is kind of not in certainly the beginning of the era of mass incarceration, but uh, so midway into the beginning of the era of mass incarceration. Uh, and certainly at a time when I think incarcerated people were less uh, less empathetic, uh, less regarded, um, very much marginalized population. I mean, not that they are marginalized right now, but even more marginalized back then, I think. Um, so basically, I was told, you know, here's an organization which always struggles to have enough volunteers. Uh, can you help out there? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, ne I didn't really come to the organization thinking, you know, I've got to work with incarcerated people. That that's my vocation or anything like that. I came to it because it was necessary, um, and you know, very very clearly, sort of the the enormity of the issue of mass incarceration came up, and not only that, of course, but the lack of access to certain things like books, for instance. Um, there was plenty of evidence then, as there is plenty of even more evidence now. That, um, that books and education are really, really incredibly important. Um, that obviously for ed education, for self empowerment, and in breaking uh, the cycle of recidivism. Uh, so that's that's kind of what got me into it. And once you get into something like book programs, it's really difficult to walk away. It's you you realise how important the work is, and that it's uh it's a marathon not a sprint so you know so you can't just like dip in and just kind of like oh i did i did it i did my bit i'm i done so if you get into it you suddenly realize oh my gosh there's so much more that can be done and so that's basically for me that we have lots and lots of volunteers and, and the volunteers who drop in are fantastic great marvelous people but there's only a very limited number of people who are had the commitment level to actually stay and do the organizing and do the 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 unpleasant work of fundraising of buying things of organizing things of staffing things and so you know that's that was my level of commitment i've probably talked way too much now moira over to you not at all um well, building off that, uh, James, you, you write about uh, the need for books inside in your chapter in the book. Can you talk a little bit about why there's a need for um, books for folks inside? Hi, Maura, and thanks all for, for coming in and for the question. Um, I mean, I think I always start from a place that... Um, People who are incarcerated, people who are in captivity, have many of the same needs as everyone else. And I'm always resistant to um, unintentionally thinking of them differently than, than I think of myself currently. Um, that being said, while the needs are the same, the degree of need is vastly different. When you are 
held in a space where um, certain things are extremely scarce physiologically, um, emotionally, and something that, that I think is, I've thought often about books and literature, especially while inside is, it can be a treasured form of escape. It can be a bridge to connection. Um, it can be um, a way to build our own skill development, our own, um, the world that we are, or the value or the identity that we are, are aspiring to. It can also be a way to deconstruct um, some of the things that, that brought you to that moment in your life. And then above it all, it can, it connects you, literature connects you to, to the world. Um, I think I'm one who, who can say like, I primarily connect to the world through thought. I engage with people, um, their ideas. I um, reflect on them, sometimes give them back, add to them, take from them. And I think um, literature is a way to subvert the individual captivity of prison and help people usher into a more collective space and mindset. Thank you. That was lovely and inspiring. Um, uh, Julie, um, I think James touched on this, but can you speak to some of the ways that sending a book inside intervenes in maybe this carceral system? Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, definitely building on that. Um, I think the first way that it, uh, that sending a book intervenes is, you know, materially, physically, moving objects from the outside to the inside. And exactly as James was saying, creating access to those resources which are needed and wanted by people on both sides of the bars. Um, and that is actually really key because there's so many things that we can't trans transport, right? We always say in our volunteer orientations that, you know, we send books because we can't send food or medical care. <laughs> um, so they, these are the things that we can send. Um, so it creates an intervention there. Um, but it also creates an intervention for the people who are sending. Um, it intervenes relationally um, to create relationships. Some of those relationships, you know, for volunteers who are more sporadic, stay a little bit more on the surface, but <clears throat> they can also turn into very deep relationships through letter writing, correspondence, and, and other forms of mutual aid. Um, and even just kind of giving people who may not have any other organic ties to the system of incarceration, um, a sense that they have something in common with people inside and it creates that linkage. Um, I think it can also create a political intervention, um, certainly depending on the type of books and materials that are being sent. Um, it can nurture kind of political development, which is very important to some people who do prison books work and not as important to others, um, but certainly uh, those are some of the books that people have the least access to. So when we can uh, facilitate that, that's very important. Um, and I think also politically, again, for the folks, for the volunteers, for the folks on the outside, um, it may intervene into beliefs or assumptions that they have about incarcerated people or about the system of incarceration. I think some people may come to the work initially seeing it as uh, largely you know charitable or humanitarian and it may stay that way for them um, but what we've seen is the more interaction people tend to have with the system of incarceration the more antagonist and more the more antagonistic they feel to it um, even if it's in kind of limited mild institutional ways just you know the first time that you have a prison administrator like lie to your face you know on the phone about some book or something that happened or that they're uh, uh, accusing you or your uh, group of 
sending in contraband, um, you, you actually kind of come into direct, uh, you're certainly not on the front lines as the people we send things to are, but you kind of come into um, greater and greater antagonism, I think, um, with the prison system, oftentimes, not always. So I think that's an intervention as well. So it's very bi-directional, um, the interventions. And I, and I do want to say, too, that I think we can't like overstate the level of the intervention or like misrepresent the nature of it. The reality is that, you know, we're sending in resources. We're not, we're getting things in, we're not getting people out. Um, we are not, I would argue, like fundamentally changing the role that prisons play in our society or the way they operate or, you know, preventing them from functioning. Um, so, you know, and, and recognizing that even in some ways, some of these projects that we run, um, which are very important for all the reasons we've identified, um, can also be kind of subsumed into a strategy of like reformism or counterinsurgency um, in different ways um, that make the prison system appear more palatable to people on the outside. Or, you know, I've had prison administrators say to, to me directly, uh, oh yeah, we love having books on the inside because people just stay quietly in their cells. They don't, you know, cause trouble. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, I know that in a lot of ways that represents that person, you know, having livability, survivability, staying sane um, and having things they need. But I also know that um, it it means, you know, there's certain kinds of trouble that I <laughs> wouldn't mind uh, people in the types of things that prison administrators consider trouble uh, are not all things that I necessarily want to uh prevent. So <laughs> uh, I think it's a complex, complex set of interventions. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Julie. You brought up a lot of stuff that hopefully we can, uh, you know, have more grist for the mill during our, our Q&A conversation, definitely. Um, so Andy, there are a lot of um, challenges that are facing this kind of like you know, simple um, and and maybe not so revolutionary um, <laughs> move of just handing someone a book. Can you tell us um, what you're most concerned about right now and what you think needs to be done in order to keep being able to send books to people inside? I'll I'll try. <laughs> uh, so if you if you'd asked me that a few years ago, I think I probably would have said, well, the disappearance of the paper book might be a real issue that, you know, so that we had some concerns that, gosh, the publishers are going to go away and we won't have anything to send in and people will be tied to tablets, which can then be easily controlled and will you know, sort of the costing to it uh, of the folks would be uh, impossible. Um, that I'm concern pretty much has receded at this point in time. Certainly we've got plenty of books um, to go in. Nowadays, well, well first I, I should point out that um, it's never easy uh, to send books in to prisons, to individuals in prisons. Um, there's, there's always been uh, states and systems which have uh, created um, uh, barriers, blockades, obstacles to getting books in, whether they're content-based or non-content-based, meaning sort of um, the, the subject matter of the particular books is something that the prison doesn't like, so they don't want people to read it, or it's the actual books themselves, like uh, hardback books, they don't, they, they're worried about contraband or something like that being. Um, and the other thing that uh, people watching may not necessarily, I mean, they, they probably know, but they probably don't know, no, is that that we're dealing with, you know, potentially hundreds or indeed thousands of different jurisdictions. So we have the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which is a big prison system across the United States, but we also have the state systems and they are separate from the federal system. Um, and they are they are in their own right, depending on the state, really huge or, or slightly less huge. And then of course, it, you can get down to the county and local level. So you can have county jails and, and sheriff's office, which have their own sort of rules about what they will accept and what they will not accept. So keeping on top of restrictions in all these hundreds or thousands of jurisdictions is, is really difficult and they are really incredibly varied. So that's one thing, um, but that's been, been essentially um, uh, 
something that, that we've always had to deal with. Um, I think for me, one of the big concerns is the spread of what we at Books Prisoners call scan and shred. And I'm sure there's a technical term for it, but uh, I can describe what it is. And that is essentially that um, prison systems, particularly states, but certainly down to the county levels, are um, only accepting letters from people uh, sorry, they're, they're funneling uh, letters from family members, friends, or loved ones, children, and they're scanning them, and then they're destroying the letters and uh, just sending the e-scans into people. And depending on where you are, that can have a, a slight effect or a very heavy effect on sending in things like books, because the systems are really set up for receiving correspondence less so receiving books so that you know oftentimes systems prison systems will will, will only deal with this as an afterthought and really an afterthought after you know organizations like ours have, have kicked up the fuss and said hey you know this system that you just isn't introduced what are you what are you doing regarding books and how are we going to do this um so that is something which is an increasing headache i just uh only a few years ago pennsylvania started the trend but it has accelerated since then to uh several different states and doing it and i imagine that we can very possibly see that across all the states pretty soon and and the reason for this or at least the purported reason as far as we understand it is this concern over contraband that julie mentioned a little bit earlier and i think very specifically the bugbear at the moment of course is fentanyl and opioids and how those can possibly be uh, introduced through the system of course we know from our own experience that books and certainly books from prison book programs are never I, i'm gonna guess uh, uh, the source of these kind of things um they, they come in in very different ways and we could talk about what the different ways are but um it's 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 kind of a bugbear as i said uh, a boogeyman in the background um uh yeah so that, that's my answer <laughs> yeah um yeah certainly the um the content neutral censorship that we're seeing approved vendors no free books no used books all that stuff um is very tied to the digital scanning of paper mail and correspondence and and just denying people the right to have communication with folks outside and and stuff so thanks for bringing that up andy um um james you 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 know there are so many concerns that um you know, we have for, for people who are locked inside. Um, and, you know, it seems like um, reading in literature and, and getting books to folks might be kind of esoteric. And perhaps, you know, the argument could be made that, like, we should focus more concretely on something else, you know, like Julie was saying, like medical care or food. Um, so I know that you, you talked about some of the values of, you know, why people uh, need literature inside. Um, but um, can you talk a little bit more about maybe philosophically kind of like the mutual aid um what what are your thoughts on on the role of of mutual aid as you know uh, for folks who are locked up thank you for that question i guess i'd i'd, I'd start by by building on something that that i heard in in andy's answer which is um in a capitalist society, and thinking of carceral responses as an extension of that, um, controlling supply and demand is a source of power and control. And um, important for the dehumanization of people being held in captivity. Um, and it's one of the, the things that makes books extremely dangerous, but also weirdly at times the least threatening thing in in prison. Um, I've been in segregated housing in solitary confinement where a book cart would be rolled down the aisle and the only thing I would have access to uh, would be a book. Um, and we all know that there are books that are banned um, and that the control of the, the bringing them in and the sending them out is intrinsically tied to, to the prison's need to 
to be in control and be in power. I would argue that um, in a world where where power is is a considered the highest good or the highest need, that anything and everything could be contraband, and that narratives that inform that this is contraband or that are contraband um, are invalid and and not credible. Um, and so, I'll start there and and say like. Um, Perhaps a simpler answer for for why it's valuable and important is mutual aid is is because quality of life cannot merely be defined by having our physiological needs met. We have to feed our minds, we have to feed our brains, we have to feed our emotions, we have to feed our comfort, we have to be nurtured, we have to find a sense of belonging, and books and literature can provide all of that. Um, I can't tell you, um, but I think everyone here knows the feeling of walking somewhere, seeing someone reading a book that you've read or that you want to read. And initially, it, it just bringing people together. Um, I think that um, that type of comfort to people who are in um, sites of extreme deprivation um, are vital. I, I think, and, and I, and I'll close with the example I, I remember. I remember when I first arrived at prison, um, and I did not have any source of money. I did not have any income. I didn't have any supplies. My basic needs were not met. And the person that I knew dropped off a bag in front of my door, and in the bag he had kind of like toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, all of the basics that I need. And then he had some cookies and some chips as well. And later on, I I asked him about it and he said, like, I like those things. I thought you would, too. Um, he recognized intrinsically that it wasn't about meeting my basic needs, but it was about seeing me as a person. And oh, wow. Um, seeing me as a person and um, treating me holistically and um, that's what literature provides or can provide is it's a way to um, meet the needs of the entire person, not just their basic needs in an, um, in an extreme environment. Thanks, James. Um, so Julie, um, mutual aid can deliver all this wonderful stuff, but organizing an all volunteer grassroots collective and keeping it going can be not um, as inspiring on the day to day. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ways that you've found it helpful to sustain projects and the communities of people that are involved? Yeah, and I feel like more and I have like a particular orientation on this since it's the same project. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so much of it is just like your basic good group process stuff, especially good when I say group process, you know, to me, those are largely like non hierarchical or like non professionalized spaces um, where, you know, having recurring meeting time. It seems so obvious, and yet it is like the biggest differentiator of any project I've ever been part of, prison books and otherwise. Like having a recurring meeting time is so crucial for creating that continuity, for creating a space for volunteer development, not just recruitment, but development, right? Like when you have, I think, um, uh, I forget who spoke to this, maybe it was Andy, um, you know, you've got folks who come in and out and that's fine. It's super helpful because these are labor intensive projects. We need people coming in all the time. Um, but when you do have someone who you <clears throat> see is interested at a deeper level, you need something to like invite them to and give them a space for greater ownership in the project. So, um, you know, making sure that you have those spaces um, and making sure that you have communications infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> like I remember, I may write, the, write about this in, in the chapter, there was a time when the project was kind of dormant or quasi dormant. And one of, I think, well, one of the reasons for that, but I think also one of the reflections of that was that we like had email and Facebook accounts, but no one had the passwords. So 
<laughs> you know, there's like functionally useless communications infrastructure. So one of the things that we did as part of this, like, okay, we're going to tighten it up. We're going to get our act together was getting new accounts um, and making sure that <clears throat> people uh, have a way to not just for us to contact people, but for people to contact us. Um, and I think that was part of sustaining the project because it brought so much energy in having people reach out and be like, hey, can I volunteer? And then we would say yes, or we would say, you know, uh, come to our packaging party, which is another uh, piece of that kind of vital infrastructure is, um, and I know groups do this all the different ways. And I think I was actually reading in the book about uh, a previous iteration of Astral Prison Books where the packaging parties were weekly, um, they're monthly now. Um, but you know, whatever it is, whatever that rhythm is, having a space to invite people to um, on a consistent basis and just doing it as horizontally as possible, you know? Um, and I think that's why having those structures and those spaces is important because you know, okay, like a meeting's coming up. So do you always have the same person, you know, announcing that meeting and assembling the agenda and facilitating? No, you can put some intentionality into saying like, hey, we would like it if these meetings were, uh, you know, if, the, if those were tasks that were distributed. Um, and so doing things, but also not like in a way of like haranguing people, like it's not about, you know, apportioning some like guilt of, you know, task economy where we're just kind of trying to get people to do as much as they can. It's it's about, um, you know, recognizing and facilitating like ownership in, in the project and having it be shared. And so finding moments, whether that's like a end of year look back or something to be like, here are all the things that go into the work that we're doing. You know, how can we ensure that these are being done equitably? Um, and just seeing people step up into like exciting. I think one of the things that people really like about uh, this work, once they like realize that it might not be similar to other spaces they've been in, if they've only been in kind of like more traditional nonprofits or businesses, is they realize really quickly that there's like autonomy and creativity built into almost like the expectation. <laughs> um, and so when people are like, oh, can we do a fundraiser? It's like, yeah, <laughs> like do it, you know? I'm not gonna tell you not to raise money for us. And, you know, there is some accountability there of like, I guess, you know, in theory, someone could do a fundraiser that had something that, you know, people disagreed with, but hey, that's why you have recurring meetings. You talk about it and uh, ensure that folks are on board. Um, so I could like get so far into the weeds, it would just <laughs> probably be very boring at a certain point for <laughs> everyone, but um, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> leave it there. Thanks, Julie. I, um, your thought about the fundraisers made me think about an incident that is actually detailed in the book. Um, you know, we have some sidebars throughout the book and um, some of them are, anecdotes that we solicited from prison book volunteers and one of them is about a benefit that was a book burning it was apparently there was an overstock of incredibly bad books which every prison book program will be very familiar with because someone um, tries to donate books that are moldy from the 70s that nobody wants and you don't know what to do with them you cannot bring them to goodwill they don't compost so they had a book burning I don't suggest that but <laughs> it did happen it's in the book um okay Andy so if people want to get involved in this work what do you suggest that they do uh Specifically to do with prison book programs, I would say, well, first of all, if you live in an urban centre, uh, there are maybe 50, maybe a few more than 50 active prison book programs around the country right now. So there's, if you live in an urban centre, there's, a, there's a, a slight chance, fairly good chance that you actually have a group near you. Uh, do a Google search and find them out and join them and see if you like the work. As uh, the folks have been saying, it's kind of different and, and each group will be different. Like where I've, I've been and volunteered at 
a lot of different groups and they all do things very, very differently. Um, of course, there is the chance that you are not in a city where they have uh, a group like this. That's where it gets a little bit more complicated, I think. Um, I'd still do sort of a, an internet internet search and find a, 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 either a group in your region or state or uh, a group that you think that you really like and uh, offer support. Uh, don't just do things without having communicated with them first. So find out what they need, because maybe they don't need any books whatsoever, or they only need certain kinds of books. So check in with them, commu communicate, and uh, sort of uh, they'll, they'll tell you basically what they need. Uh, most groups will need money. Uh, so as people say, arranging fundraisers is often uh, uh, something that people like. Um, but Yes, there is responsibility uh, that goes with that. So again, keep checking and keep the communications up with that. Um, in terms of doing the actual work in, if you don't live in a city that currently has a group, what I would say is, is don't leap into creating a, a, a group, an individual group yourself, uh, unsupported yourself at this point in time. If you have uh, a group of a, a small number of people or a large number of people who are interested in doing this kind of stuff and have a degree of commitment. You could, so for instance, set up a, a, an ad hoc or a short term group and, and connect with, again, one of these other established groups around the country to say, hey, we have a bunch of people. We've been gathering books for three months, four months, and we have some money. So if you trust us and you tell us the ways that you like things to do we can take some of the letters that you do uh, and sort of not create a, like a mailing address for themselves other than sort of get letters from a different program to create your own independent program is is really a huge amount of work um i i mean i i and i'm sure other folks on this call get uh, uh, emails or calls from people who are interested in doing that exactly this and I kind of caution them about these other these prior steps first but if someone tells me that they have a group of three or four people who are really committed uh, people who are willing to commit themselves for I don't know two or three or more years to do to get a project off the ground and to sustain it I'll talk to you about how you do that um, and the reason why I, I don't want to encourage people who don't have that level of commitment is that when you get your address out there and say to people, hey, you guys in prison, these, we're, we're ready to serve you, send us your requests, that builds up that expectation. So you will get the addresses once they're out there and in prisons will get requests for years and years and years and that at various points in time over the last few decades we had to make certain kinds of cuts and, and kind of been trying to advertise that hey we don't accept these kinds of letters or, or or from these places it doesn't matter it doesn't matter people will still have this network and they will say we're going to send these letters. so you, you will get hundreds and thousands and thousands of requests and these are all people we have to remember these are all people who want a connection and if you cannot provide that connection, you are doing them a disservice. So uh, that's why I'd say don't just like off the cuff, create your own group, create a uh, mailing address. Start out slowly, start as a sport, get your feet, know that you're doing and you have that level of commitment. So um, yeah, that's that's how I would suggest you you help out. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I mean, that's a point that I don't think we touched on really, but that um, the volume of mail and the um, the volume of mail is just um, overwhelming sometimes. Um, and many prison book programs are three, four months behind um, in answering letters um, because it's there are so many people locked up who who are who are asking for books. Um, um, which, you know, James, you spoke so eloquently earlier about, you know, what, what books can mean for folks inside. What, what, are there any other things you would, um, 
suggest that people do, any actions that you think are are meaningful. So many people now are, are concerned about, you know, the state of prisons in this country and incarceration. I think for folks who are, are um, trying to, to engage in, in these programs, um, one of the things I just want to lift up is that there may be times where where you feel like you have to set boundaries in order to protect the program. Um, where you feel like um, people's outreach, their correspondence, and some of the things that that are are um, coming or beyond the scope of the program itself, and my encouragement would be to um, see people as they are and understand um, the totality of the experience. Um, I think that that um, there's certainly nothing wrong with wanting to be narrow in scope and say, "Hey, I want to. I, I just simply want to provide literature." That's only. Th- that's the extent of what I I want this to be. Um, but there's also equally nothing wrong with saying, you know what, um, I'm going to engage in correspondence with this person um, and just kind of like acknowledge that I see them, that I know them, and, and that I connect with them on a human level. I think that if you're in this because you believe in the humanity of all people and especially people who are incarcerated, then having that through line in your relationships, having that, that um, having a sense of boundaries that is not based upon either protecting the, the program or the relationships with the prison, unless absolutely essential, but actually based upon how to be healthy in a in, in a community with people who are experiencing deprivation is extremely important. And I just want to encourage people to not be too lockstep with the prison, to not unintentionally be a part or compromise too much. Like in this, there's there's no way to avoid um, compromise because you have to work with the prison to get the books in. However, um, be intentional about the places where you can be more than that, where you can can understand the value of human connection in all of its forms and and um, encourage folks. I agree. I, I can only imagine how you could easily be overwhelmed by the volume of requests. Um, I know that that's a very real thing. But I just encourage folks to Think deeply about your values going into it and find every opportunity where your values and the prison's values don't line up to maintain your own. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, Julie, any other ways um, you recommend people can, um, you know, resist the kind of system of retributive punishment that we have and, and deliver mutual aid? Yeah, and I want to avoid like just doing a laundry list because I mean, there's just so many ways and so many things, but um, I really appreciate, uh, James, what you said, lifting up just this idea of making a connection, um, letter writing. It is true. It, it would be impossible to actually develop a correspondence with every person, you know, who writes or who says that they want it. Um, but there are there are times when, you know, I've done it. There are times when other people have done it. Um, you know, we kind of made like a halting attempt to do, not to do a pen pal program, but to kind of make note of people who were asking for pen pals. And then just kind of like I autonomously would just like blast it out to like a group of people who had said, oh, I, you know, when we would have people sign up for the listserv, we would just have a column that says, like, I'm interested in pen pals. 
um, and try to connect those people. And those kinds of efforts often will cir circulate in and then circulate out. Um, an additional thing that we started doing several years ago, yeah, more than several at this point, um, was we were kind of wanting another way of interacting with people on a deeper level. And so we started like an inside outside book club um, that became, you know, a really cool project where we send the book into people and they would, uh, and we would also read it on the outside and then they would write their thoughts about it and send them into us. And then we compile everyone's uh, writings into a journal and then send that journal in so that it kind of like simulates that experience of like being in a book club. Um, so that's been a really cool thing. Um, and so that's kind of at the organizational level at the individual or just like other things that can be done, um, you know, contributing to people's commissaries and canteens. Again, that's like a, you know, not a thing that the organization does, but individuals after, especially after they develop relationships with folks, um, responding to, you know, I've seen a lot of times I'll come into the office and I'll see people have printed out some information for someone that uh, that asked for it, you know, kind of went above and beyond to 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 make that connection. Um, and then we have to be like, oh, actually, this is so great that you did this, but now we have to actually take this out and put it in an envelope because they have to scan the mail. So that's like one of the ways that I think like the prison system tries to mitigate against people doing exactly that, right? It, they're they're curtailing our ability to to intervene uh, at at so many junctures more and more. Um, and then, but yeah, just letter writing. Um, if there are other projects in your um, town that aren't necessarily book projects, but that have something to do with like anti-repression, um, definitely supporting people who have experienced retaliation for organizing uh, behind bars is super, super important. We saw so much retaliation after the nationwide prison strikes in 2016 and 2018, and we're still feeling, and 2021, uh, we're still seeing that. And um, outside support is like crucial for keeping, you know, those actions going. Um, so letter writing to folks there, um, I want to raise up like one particular organization or collective that uh, if folks can like follow, um, Jailhouse Lawyers Speak. Uh, is an incredible collective of incarcerated uh, prison rebels who do their own mutual aid, uh, both inside and, and outside. Um, they've got just incredible projects going. So uh, supporting folks inside in identifying what they need and what kind of support they want, which like they'll tell you. Um, so those are just a few of the ways. Oh, and doing phone zaps, participating in phone zaps, which is like calling in to uh, contest abusive conditions inside. And there's uh, a lot of places that post those um, opportunities to call in um, to prison administrators and, and different, you know, kind of decision makers in the carceral apparatus. And believe it or not, they, they actually work. <laughs> they do not like getting calls, especially a lot of calls. Yeah, that's true. Prisons, um, they don't like bad press. So that is on our side. <laughs> that does work in our favor. Um, I know, James, you have to go um, shortly. So maybe you want to um, uh, uh, take the, the first question um, from the attendees, which is, do you have any advice for what to say when someone at a prison claims we don't accept books because other books to prison orgs have sent in books with drugs? Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this contraband thing, and I think Andy and Julie could answer it from the, you know, perspective of, like, logistically, what do you do? But, you know, just um, what are your thoughts about, you know, um, a mail as a, as a conduit for, for contraband? I mean, as an organizer, I would say um, it's important to build relationships with, with prison staff in order to to um, advocate for your program. Like, and that organizing and that building of relationships um, is important so that in these moments, um, 
you have a, a source, a, a go to someone that you can can help. Um, get to a place of yes. Um, my understanding of relationship with with prison staff and prison officials is um, the default is always going to be no. This is an extreme bureaucracy, and you can never go back, go wrong by saying no. And just knowing that every incentive for every staff member is often to to shut it down and finding ways to build relationships to subvert that is important. Um, and that may mean um, at some point looking for um, outside help. Um, I think it's important to power map the the prison. So in California, where I'm at, every prison's a fiefdom. However, there is a central location. Um, and if you have relationships at the level above the actual prison itself, sometimes you can find allies and help with supporting um, advocacy for the program and, and help overturning those no's. It's in, um, I think it's in a lot of instances, it's, um, like I said, the default is no, the job safety, the, the like there's just, incentive after incentive to shut it down. But once you find the, um, the actual motivators, once you're able to power map who has influence um, above the, the, the level that you're dealing with and build those relationships as well, people in the past have had success um, helping them to, to um, say yes. And then I, I would um argue that it's also possibly helpful to say um what could we change that would get to you to a yes and to see if there's a way to find allies within the prison that can that can help be solution oriented and if you are not depending upon the state you're in and the prison you're dealing with if the possibility exists to build relationships with the teachers and librarians, um, it's always helpful to do so. Yeah, I my brain doesn't always go there, but thanks for that. Um, it is it is important to find allies, um, you know, people who can who who have authority within the hierarchy, um, you know, and can and can sway others. Um, Andy or Julie, do you have any ideas um, for what to to say when a prison claims that you know they can't accept um, free books because um, these free books have been um, Apparently laden with drugs. Yeah, I, I can uh, basically build on uh, a little bit on what James was saying, I mean, uh, and basically James was uh, hit, hitting the, the nail on the head. Is that uh, sometimes you're going to come across uh, even down to the individual level. So these these jurisdictions that I talked about, I think in my second great answer, that that's true, but. The jurisdictions also break down into individual prison superintendents, and then below that, the sergeants of the mailroom. They oftentimes have a pretty uh, independent, pretty a larger degree of independence. And if they say no to something, it, it's no until you potentially go above their head and actually create or use that relationship that you already had with the superintendent or with the uh, director of prisons or or something like that and, and that's certainly uh, something that that we've had to do under certain circumstances the the, the washington news book ban in 2019 was a great example of using a number of not only grassroots but also media and direct relationships with various levels of the system that we were trying to fight against making this decision this arbitrary decision um, but uh, yes also talking it, one of the issues is of course if you if your group is dealing with a bunch of different jurisdictions you only have a certain degree of bandwidth and, and capacity for dealing with it and these kind of restrictions are labor intensive so 
in the case of the the person who whose question this was if if there's a single prison which is which is affecting you in this way okay you can deal with that you can go you can do those relationship building and so like when when you do it on a on a, a national level it becomes much more complex and and, and at, at points in time you just have to say i as a volunteer don't have the bandwidth the time to deal with this there are so many other places where people are wanting books where we can get books into i'm i'm sorry but i have to focus on those kind of things and it, it's not an easy thing it's not a comfortable thing to say to have to say to yourself sometimes but sometimes that is the case but yeah relationships work uh communications julie Yeah, I don't have a ton to add. Um, you know, we've had we've we've had this problem recur a number of times and we've actually always been able to either, as James said, like get to yes, um, simply with, you know, just calling and, and just kind of sticking to the line of like, oh, well, you know, we don't send books that have contraband in them. And if you have any documented, you know, instances of that ever happening, you know, certainly we've never heard about it. Um, you know, it's not our policy. And um, we've been able to, to do that multiple times. And there's only one time where uh, we have been and to this day are banned from one specific facility, even though, you know, I say like all the other wardens down the road from you, we're all, you know, we're sending to all of these facilities. And it's just, um, and it wasn't just us, it was also all of the North Carolina programs are, are not um, operational in, in that facility anymore either. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't accusation based, it was just, no, this isn't happening anymore. A new warden came in, decided he was gonna, you know, be the one to, to show that he was doing something about the contraband issue. And, um, you know, we we haven't really focused on relationship building. Um, I think it's it's not really our orientation. Um, but uh, I think one thing that can be helpful is mobilizing the voices of people who like people inside and being like, hey, we're being banned from your facility. If you want to like kick up a fuss, if you want to write grievances, if you want to get your friends and family to call and complain about this and say, you know, let let this program back in. Um, that's something that I think we could do more of um, to try to to move a recalcitrant administration. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, asking for evidence is within your rights and um, it's a degree of accountability that is often not um, demanded of prisons because the people inside don't have a lot of power to demand accountability for things. Um, so, you know, asking for like, okay, can you please send me the positive test results that shows whatever you're claiming is actually in that book? Um, I think it's a pretty low, low bar ask. Um, and then, you know, um, you can reach out to me. <laughs> um, and um, I can, I can, uh, you know, work with you from there because um, having done this work for a long time, I know how much effort people put into it, and um, I, I'm very sure that um, that nobody's doing it um, for uh, to send fentanyl. <laughs> There's easier ways. <laughs> I hear. Um, um, so. Uh, we have another question, too, um, that's asking about, do you have any advice for combating feelings of disappointment or guilt when um, prison books programs go dormant? Um, well, I mean, you know, guilt guilt has a function. <laughs> it, it is communicating that something is going wrong. Like if you feel bad about it, um, it, it might be because you need to, to get on top of it. Um, so, you know, I don't really have any advice for combating the guilt other than to say, you know, 
face it, acknowledge it. That's what happened with our project when it was dormant. And we, um, we had to make some hard choices in order to get it back on track, like the main one. So at this time, you know, we were a year behind in letters um, and we had a very sad conversation where we were discussing just clearing out our backlog, like throwing letters away. Um, and, you know, we kind of went back and forth and there were some folks who were like, but we can't just, you know, not do these letters. And it was like, well, we're not doing them any, we're not doing them. They're in a box. Um, and, you know, it basically boiled down to, but this feels bad. And, and we were like, yeah, it should feel bad because we're failing. <laughs> um, and so uh, that was important to acknowledge and to decide that if we were going to be accountable to the work, we had to get back to a baseline where we could actually be effective and then hold ourselves accountable to that baseline of like, okay, we are never going to be back here again. We're never going to let it get bad like this again. So let's face the fact that we have not done our best and do better. And we have, which is great. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts for that, Andy? Andy's like, I don't have any guilt. My <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep on doing it, whatever. Uh, you go as you go away and do it. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, as, as Julie said, I mean, the guilt is there for a reason. You, you feel bad because you aren't doing the work. But, you know, if you started the work as a group and then the other people have sloughed off and there's only one or a very small number of you, it is untenable. The work is really hard. All kinds of work are really hard, but this kind of work also is really hard. Um, but the, the, I think rather than wallowing in the guilt of a program which no longer is functional, the idea would for me would be to re-channel the, the, those feelings of guilt, that energy, into something productive, whether that is, uh, you know, helping an uh, an active group, or doing something else to support the the work, find something else uh, to to put that energy into, and and sort of like you'll get over it, and sort of you can't keep everything alive all the time. That's just not possible. Do something though. Yeah, I, I combat my feelings of guilt by doing things. Um, I think that's good advice. <laughs> um, do either of y'all have any kind of closing thoughts that you'd like to offer as takeaways or responses that you haven't been able to, there hasn't been space to articulate? I don't think so. Um, I think I just appreciate, yeah, I super appreciate Moira and Mac for putting this volume together and for, you know, Andy and James being here. And just, um, yeah, I guess like my, the last thing is, um, I think this project is really cool because it shows uh, a really unique kind of cultural or political phenomenon of these projects. Like when I think about this book as kind of like a cultural history or something, um, you know, this is like a 50 year phenomenon in some places or 30 or 20 years. Like these are long running projects spanning the entire country that, you know, hundreds and thousands of people over these years have participated in directly. Um, and they're all autonomous. It's entirely, it's not just decentralized. I mean, they're all autonomous groups that are not, you know, they're not even chapters, um, but we're all in relationship with each, with each other. And I guess, I mean, Andy didn't even talk about the, the national, you know, the servant stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just such a unique model. And I kind of was always surprised that there wasn't something like this describing this very interesting phenomenon, especially, you know, kind of in as an anarchist, like it, there's something so anarchistic about it um, that's very interesting to me. So, 
you know, maybe it's just like a nerdy thing that people who are involved in this work find interesting, but I just think it's a cool uh, recognition of, of this, this form that has proliferated and um, has so much internal diversity uh, within, within the movement. So thank you for presenting that to people in its fullness. Yeah, I mean, I can just echo that, you know, it, it, to, to, to think that it, the movement has been around for 50 years and, and nobody's really put together a, a history up to this point. I mean, such a lot of action and activity has been lost because those people have moved on, the people who started. I mean, I think our longest term volunteer has now been with the organisation for 35 years but that's still an entire 15 years before their time we have no records of whatsoever um, so that's not encapsulated necessarily in the book the entire history but we've caught something and you you have caught something uh, Moira um, and so I'm really grateful for that and I hope I mean this is a niche book definitely a niche book uh, but it's, as for, as Julie said, it's it's not simply niche for people involved in prison book programs, but it's also people who are interested a in prison issues, but also people who are interested in organisation and that grassroots organisation of these free flowing organisations are all independently starting up and maintaining them themselves, largely through volunteer work. Uh, so you know, there's there's a lot of different aspects of those of this organization uh, in or this organism uh, in the book and you don't necessarily have to read the whole darn thing my chapter is probably the most boring one sorry um, but <laughs> but you can find something in there that will really I think pique your, pique your interest if you get a hold of it so I do encourage you to get this book yeah thanks y'all um i agree i think um you know the the movement has always kind of inspired me that you know we operate so antithetically to what so much of mainstream culture claims it's impossible to do otherwise right like we don't have paid staff we don't um, have, you know, lots of money. We don't have, you know, we do it in our spare time. Um, we're giving we're giving things away for free um, to people who we don't even know. Apparently, all of this is like against human nature, and yet it's been going on for, you know, 50 years. Um, with, as Andy said, you know. Um, probably more people than we can count and more definitely more people than are included in the book. And um, I hope every single person that's ever even stepped into a prison book program one time um, gets a chance to to have a, a copy of the book so that they can, you know, have a testament to to some of the work that they've done that's so, um, so positive and um, and opposed to kind of the mainstream culture that just sees us all as so um, tied up in in things that are, are exploitative. Um, well, thanks to you both and, and to James for, for being here. And thanks so much to Haymarket, um, which, um, you know, so graciously agreed to, to host this. I just want to shout out Haymarket's Books Not Bars program, which sends free titles from that are published from Haymarket to folks inside. And Haymarket has some of the most inspiring and, and thought provoking books that are being published right now. So, um, you know, if you um, you can sign up to support someone who has asked Haymarket to send them free books through the Books Not, um, books not Bars program. Um, you can sponsor them um, and they can get free books all year long, new through Haymarket. Um, but as, as we've been saying, you can also look up your local chapters of prison book programs. Um, they're online, so Google is your friend. Um, and thanks everybody. It's been really fun chatting. I'll see y'all soon.